Amen. Defend us in this day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of Almighty God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who roam throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Pray for us. Welcome back, guys. As you know, we're covering John. We're in Holy Week, the greatest time, the greatest mystery we meditate on continuously, the Paschal Mystery, uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday, with that great mystery of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, all condensed into one. Uh, we're on John chapter 15, so Jesus now is in the Kidron Valley, making his way to the Mount of Olives. So the Last Supper has just happened. Jesus has just made them priests. Uh, he's just given the Eucharist, the life-giving source. The source and summit, as the Vatican II calls it. Um, now we're in John chapter 15, continuing on from last week when Jesus began to open his heart to the disciples, revealing other mysteries and new mysteries to them, um, especially to Philip, we recall, to Philip and to Thomas, doubting Thomas, even doubting you know, a little bit earlier on John 14, but now we're in John chapter 15. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may, it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Abide in me. So he who abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burnt. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Amen. Very consoling words, very beautiful words of our Lord Jesus. Uh, again, a very famous, very famous sayings of the Lord Jesus in this chapter. And I'm sure you recognize a lot of them, if not um, all of them. But what does it mean, the true vine? Well, we know, if you know like what a grape vine is or other vine fruits or vegetables. Um, they have one stem and from that stem, you can have an amazing, you know, hundreds of meters, a hundred meters long, amazing vine just from one stem. Jesus is saying that I am that vine. I'm the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. What does a vine dresser do? What does a gardener do? They prune their fruit. They prune the leaves, probably the Lebanese mums, to get the water arish from the um, plant. So they are, in a sense, the vine dresser. They go, they like take care of their vine leaf to make sure it's bearing good, good vines, you know, to make water arish, whatever. Um, but God's saying, that's him. So he's going to go, and he's, as Jesus says, every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. So if the grapevine's not bearing vines or the arish is not very good, the, I don't know what to say it's called in English, the vine thing, whatever it is, if yeah. it's not good, it's like a green leaf that you, people eat, yeah. edible vine, leaf. Vine, vine, vine leaf. leaf, oh yeah, that's right, literally. There you go. Vine leaf. Um, that's exactly what it's called in English, yeah. So if it's not doing its thing, what do they do? They come and they cut it off and they prune it and they get it ready. Jesus is saying that if people don't bear fruit, he takes away, he being the father. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So what happens when you prune a tree? I mean, people do gardening here, the fruit, the yield becomes greater and better. You actually have to prune your trees to have a greater yield of fruit, um, believe it or not. So that's what Jesus says he'll do to us. What does that mean? It means mortification, it means carrying the cross. It means suffering so that we become greater in purity and perfection and holiness. Because it's through you know, the chasuble of suffering that we are we become holy and glorified, tried like gold in the furnace. Scripture uses that sort of language. Jesus is saying that's what's going to happen 
you know, if we do the right thing, we'll become saints. In essence, that's what that's saying. Mm. If you serve me, if you bear the fruit, my father and I are going to take you to heaven and make you saints. In simple terms, that's what it's saying. Why? So that it may bear more fruit. So that we can serve God and continue to serve Him even greater. Then Jesus says something very interesting. You are already made clean by the word I have spoken to you. What does Jesus mean by that? You are already made clean. See, the Jews had a lot of ablutions or ritual purity. We don't do ablutions, fathers' ablutions um, in the Mass, but not for the, not in a sense that He's unclean, but in a ritual what's, sense. What's an ablution? Cleanse it with water. So the Muslims still do it. Um, the Jews still do it today. We do it. We do it with holy. Probably yes. Church. Yes, it's sort of, but it's not like we, we wash everything and wash our feet and our hands. It's a type yeah, of, yeah, but it's not the same as the Jewish ablution. Yeah, we don't have to do holy yeah, water. It is, it is a purification. Yes. We don't have to do it. They had to do it. If they don't, if they don't wash their hands and their feet, and if they don't cleanse themselves with physical water, it's called ablutions. That's all it is, ablution. You see the Muslims all, they roll up their pants and they oh, and they wash. I don't know if you've ever seen it, I've seen it heaps. Um, the Jews still do ablutions. That's why they had the pool of Siloam. They had pools of water, uh, flowing water, where they would wash in before they prayed. Why? Because the Jewish law prohibited people coming in dirty, physically dirty. Um, just a little, into a little backtrack. Like during the Last Supper, when Jesus washed their feet, the disciples, they had stinky feet. They walk around in sandals all day, stepping in poo, donkey poo, and you don't know what. Dirt roads, there's no concrete, nice roads and beautiful things. Their feet stunk. You know, Jesus really took the humble place. And that's why you see they have ablutions because they sort of need to. They're very, you know, that's one of the reasons. Also, it's for ritual purity. So stinky feet on Thursday. 100%. They would have had stinky feet. On Holy Thursday, I had some stinky feet. So that's why Jesus is saying to them, you don't need to do these ablutions. You're already made clean by the words which I've spoken to you. That is by faith. We follow God by faith. Our faith is more important than exterior work. Because you can do as much works as you want, but if there's no faith in your heart, there's no love in your heart, you, they're useless. They're actually useless, like the Pharisees. They had the works, but no faith to animate. No, their faith wasn't animated with charity. That's another word the Catechism likes to say. So, Joe, this exterior cleansing was what Jesus referred to as white, white acceptance? Like... Yes, that's exactly the sense. And that's why Jesus is saying to them, you're already made clean by the word I spoke to you. So, to give reference to that. Next, we have verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. Which means stay with me and I with you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Makes sense, right? Jesus is using a very physical, literal example. The grapes can't come from a grapevine if there's no vine. They don't just appear out of nowhere. They need to come from the vine. Jesus says, neither can you, unless you abide in me. So we, of course, need to stay with the Lord so that we can bear fruit, so we can be holy and, gr and great in the Lord. I am the vine and you the branches. He bears much fruit. And again, this very famous verse, for apart from me, you can do nothing. See, Jesus doesn't say from apart from me, you can do a little bit. He uses the word nothing. Now, nothing is exactly that. It's nothing. Nothing isn't something. It's nothing. What does that mean? Jesus is saying that it's His grace. Ultimately, God's grace sustains our very breath. Every breath we take, whether you're a pagan, Gentile, anything, anyone, God is sustaining our breath, even right now, because He sustains creation as it continues. He continues creation. It's amazing. If you really think about what God does and how merciful He is, even if we think, think about some people, even ourselves, if we've committed the mortal sin, you know, God has every right to take our life and to cease it. Mm. If we really think about it, offending God infinitely is no small matter. Mortal sin is no small matter. God could just say, that's enough right then and there, and people die instantly. Um, a lot of people do have sudden deaths. I don't know if it's that sudden or maybe I probably would have happened once or twice, but we do read in the lives of the saints even in St. Dominic's life, even in the book of the Rosary book, um, one of the people were laughing at Dominic when he was preaching and not believing. And then I think a big rock or something in the church fell on him and killed him right then and there. So I don't want that to be you. You don't want that, No one wants that to be them. So we just have to keep that in mind. God could do that. That's, you know, that's his, if he desires injustice, it could be very, you know, very dangerous for us. But we're always hoping God's mercy and hoping his goodness. But that's that passage, you can do nothing apart from me. So we should remember that. Whether that's as little as the breath we take, it's a gift from God. And thanks be to God for that gift that He gives us.
You know, may we be grateful for it. Then he continues, and just as I was saying, um, Jesus is saying something along the same lines. If a man does not abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch, as a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burnt. Jesus says it as simply, if you do not stay with me, you'll be cast away and you'll be thrown to the fire and burnt. Jesus speaks about hell more than he speaks about heaven. Uh, it's a very well known, unfortunately not too well known, but Jesus warns us and that's the truth. And sometimes the truth is hard. But it's an Old, that's Old the, Testament image as well from the book of uh, Jeremiah. 11 21 of us looking at a quote from Augustine Pippo. Mm -hmm. Jesus took again another Old Testament image of of the vine and the the fruit that ex, is expected of God from the vine. We read about the parable of the vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard. God provided everything for the There's vineyard. A lot of Old Testament images, a lot. Good fruit. Yeah. The the owners, the, the, the tenants Jeremiah. of the vineyard were the Pharisees. They produce no good fruit, but only produce bitter grapes. So it means the religion of the Old Testament was ultimately unable to produce the, the good fruit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, really, yes. that um, God desired. That's why the New Covenant was founded in Christ's blood. Exactly. There's, I haven't spoken about all the images. There's a lot of images, as you're saying, um, in the, of the Old Testament, those things. That's beautiful, that passage in Scripture. I'm not sure if you're of them. My beloved had a vineyard. Like from Song of he, Solomon. He, he built a tower, he fenced it in, he That's... built a wall, he planted choice vines. Yes, the Song of uh, Songs. Yeah, it's one of those parables where God does the initial building, planting, then he leaves it to the religious authorities to tend it, to, to grow the crops. That's the people of Israel yes. to produce a good fruit, which are the fruits really of the Spirit in their lives. But the Old Testament religion was unable really to do that. Yes, it was, Jeremiah. It, it's, it was meant to be that way, really, because it was only Christ founding the church who could really, through the sacraments, restore us to grace so that we could really produce the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. It was in Jeremiah, he actually said it when the people were saying, nothing's going to happen to us. Jeremiah was saying, look, if you don't change, big lamentations are going to happen, big problems are coming to you. I think it was the Assyrians were going to come and take you. And no one believed Jeremiah, as they don't believe the prophets. Literally, like Jeremiah, actually, the first half is Jeremiah, and the second half is Lamentations. If you've read, we used to be one, but now we've split into two books. Mm -hmm. But it tells you what happened. A book tired of Lamentations. A lot of Lamentations happens because no one listens. So Jeremiah goes, and he goes to them, and he says, Don't say that we have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Because the people are saying, look, we're the chosen people of God. Look, we've got the temple of God, the great temple of Solomon. Nothing's going to happen to us. Jeremiah says, don't say to yourself, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And then he gives this parable that Father Benson said about the vines. Like someone planted a vine, it yielded fruit. It was an amazing, beautiful vine. And um, the people over the vine were unfaithful. And they didn't bring its fruit. And like destruction came. And that's his, Jeremiah said, that's what's going to happen to you if you don't change. And they didn't. And that's what happens. Jesus uses that same image. Um, so there is a lot. And second reference Father Benson mentioned was the Song of Songs. Um, the, that David wrote. Oh, sorry, David. That Solomon wrote. It's about... Someone, the woman, seeking her beloved, her Dawood, her David. So David just means my beloved. The whole song of songs is about um, a woman seeking her David or her beloved. And they go in the vineyard and use a lot of beautiful language um, about nature. And she's always searching for her beloved or her David in this place. So Jesus is using this image to help us to remember that you know, we're searching for him as well. Ultimately, he's our beloved. He's our David, our, our my beloved. So we're always on the search for him. But thanks for There's also a couple other images in the Psalms that we'll see how we go if we can get there. Um, we'll go back to verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified. That she bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Again, we see this perfectly fulfilled in the saints. The saints who asked Lord for the healing, or prayed and the Lord gave healing. The saints who prayed and the Lord healed their prayers. There are, even for us sometimes, I pray we experience that. Of course, I'm sure we have, like, Lord, you've asked for a certain thing and God has granted that certain grace or that certain thing. 
Um, ultimately, all our prayers ultimately should be orientated for the glory of God. As Jesus says, you know, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, which means good works, good deeds, um, saving souls, in essence. St. John Vianney used to be able to read souls and do heaps of miracles when he was alive. But he always accounted spiritual healings greater than physical healings. A lot of people would come to him and they'd leave physically healed. But St. John Vianney actually recount, he recounted, he valued the spiritual healing greater. And I feel like God's helped me to see that. Because even if someone's um, leg doesn't work or they're paralyzed and they start walking again, like Lord and Fatima, all these beautiful apparitions, what if their soul isn't healed? What if, like the Pharisees, as very often the case, the more miracles they see, it seems like the more hard on their hearts get, um, as unfortunately often the case. So we have to keep that in mind. Do we ask God, what do we ask Him first? Are we asking in the spirit of, Lord, your will be done, because you know what's good? Or are we asking, Lord, give me this, because I think it's good in my eyes? Ultimately, we should pray, Lord, you know, help me to find good you know, in my eyes what's good in yours, or help me be conformed to your will, to be unified with you. Uh, but also, again, don't be afraid to ask Jesus for what we need and what we want. Because He does, He likes to give. God does like to give us and to grant us. Sometimes I feel like you can take the extreme where we ask for everything and it's like irrelevant things or... Nothing's irrelevant in God's eye, I take that back. Things that are not good for us or we just ask for nothing and only pray for sanctification. Depending, you can pray for sanctification for God's will to be filled. That's a beautiful thing. But you can also ask God for things. Um, Lord, help me raise money for this church so that we can build a new altar or we can do something like help me do X so I can do Y. We can make prayers like that and that's a very normal part of the spiritual life. Um, it's just, you don't want to say, Lord, can I have a million dollars so I can, you know, eat and just enjoy my life whereas you just will forget everyone else. Like something in a balance where you're considerate of others but also God knows your needs. You know, He knows everything we need. Um, Matthew chapter 6 or chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount <coughs> You know, your father knows you need these things. Don't be like the Gentiles. It talks about clothing and um, food and, and stuff. God knows what we need. So we should have a providence in him. But also we can ask, Lord, X, Y, Z. Whatever it is. Lord, help me. I'll give you an example of mine. A simple example. Um, really interested in going to the gym. It's one of my hobbies. I found that all the gym people on YouTube were like a little bit liberal or they'd swear a lot or they wouldn't be like very completely wholesome people, said, Lord, send me someone who's Catholic on YouTube who goes to the gym. And I found this guy, his name was Chris something. He was on YouTube, but I'd never ever heard of his channel. He just came up on my feed, like randomly. And I just started watching him. And I, you know, I was like, thanks be to God. There you go. God heard my prayer. It's like the only one I've ever seen who's actually Catholic, devout, has a channel about like fitness and YouTube, uh, fitness on YouTube. You used to so, yeah, yeah, Ifra still does. She still has one. I did, yeah, I stopped that. But, uh, I did, yeah. But, so that's a little prayer that God answered for me, you know. Just something small. God, I saw the need. God knows I was doing it for His glory, and like, honestly. Mm -hmm. And He heard my prayer. Just something small, right? But it's something good. So that does happen. <laughs> Thanks, <man. laughs> no, no, no. Now it's for Ifra and baby. Now the, 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 the monthly video is five months. Oh, look at that. I didn't do that. I never did that. I didn't modestly come on, Father. No. No. I know, I know, I know. Wow. Well, it'll be a good, be a good session. <laughs> no. uh, we're on verse 9 now. As, so as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. It means to stay in my love. Remain in my love. Be in my love. And then he says how you do it. Which is what everyone should be asking. How do I do this, Lord? How do I fulfill your words? He says, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. It means to do the will of God. See, the rich man, the rich young man came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, the very famous uh, gospel account. Jesus said, obey the commandments. You know, he listed the commandments, honor your father, mother, X, Y, Z. He's like, I've done this, you know, since my youth or something. He said, I've done this. He says, what do I lack? He said, Jesus said, you lack still one thing. Go and see all you have and come follow me. See, the commandments of the Old Testament, yeah, they're good, they're amazing. Um, but Jesus asks us something even greater. 
It's the total self-giving. We can give God our food, our wealth. We can give God everything, our penance, our suffering. But the greatest thing we can give God, and the saints talk about this, and hopefully this is a good thing to bring up today, it's to give Him our will, our very desire, our very action, our very life. That's the greatest offering we can give to God. Santa Fonda's Lord Gloria talks about it in his book, Uniformity with the Will of God, which I just recently read, thank God. Uh, the greatest thing we can give God, because everything else is His, all the goods of the world, everything in this world is His, all our, everything is His really. But what He gives us an option to do is to follow Him. That to give us his to give us our will, our desire, our life orientation, whatever you want to call it, our our goals, our mind space, our desires, or in Catholic terms, our will. You know, can, are we going to give all this to God? That's the greatest thing we can give, and that's what that rich man lacked. He, that rich young man, chose his money more than he would have chose the will of God, which would have been to sell his money, to sell to give to the poor, to come follow Jesus, because he was attached to his wealth. The question for us is. How are we going to keep His commandments to abide in His love, to stay with Him, just like He kept the fathers and stayed with the Father? What are we going to do? It, it begs the question of why were the, the fishermen able to divest themselves of their livelihood so easily? With still a lot to lose and they could do it quite easily and He couldn't do it. Yes, well, the fisher, the, sometimes we take we think that they were just poor people. They, they weren't actually poor no, like weren't. because if you were poor, you wouldn't have... Well, number one, they had their fish business. Number two, um, they had a servant. The scripture said they had their hired servants. Mm -hmm. If you're poor, doing it tough, you'll see people now, people with small businesses. The guy has to work. He's not just managing. But these people, they were working, but they also had hired people. So they were making some sort of money to have enough money to not just work in the family business, but to hire outsiders to come and work I for think, them. I think it, so, it shows like a chosen, they cast an, in, an inaccurate viewpoint on their livelihood as you know, just getting by when maybe they were doing very well. A little bit better, yeah. I mean, maybe some of the others were a bit tight, like, for whatever reason. But Matthew was a tax collector, so he had money, probably more than all of them. But it's good that we see people from various classes and the society of the Jewish time following Jesus, because Jesus is for everyone, you know. So I guess it sort of represents that. Anyone can follow Jesus, whether you're rich or you're poor, whether you're young or you're old. Christ calls everyone. And then my favourite verse, maybe, of tonight. Every verse is my favourite verse, as you can probably tell. Uh, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you. So Jesus is saying, this is, the reason that I've spoken these things to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Jesus, another verse says, I came to give you life, and life to the full. That's the purpose. The purpose is for life, and life everlasting. For great joy. And joy to the fullest. See, baby's got it. Baby's enjoying that. He's in a state of grace, in simplicity, in his innocence, and he's enjoying it. There's no burden on his conscience. There's no, oh, I've got this, I've got that. It's Lord, your will be done. You know, simple. That's the example. Jesus pointed to the children and said, let them come to me. That's the, how do you want to go to heaven? That's the example. Be simple, be joyful. You know, trust in the Lord. He's baptized. He's a saint. He's actually a walking saint right now. That's our example. You know, this little kid, you know, thanks be to God. Really, it's humbling for us. Very humbling. Maybe too humbling. <laughs> Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide and that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you, to love one another. Very, very uh, full-on passage. Jesus is talking about many different things. In the last chapter or two, or no, sorry, in the chapter to come, brother, when Jesus is given to Pilate, um, Pilate and Herod weren't, weren't close at all, but it's through Jesus' crucifixion that they became friends that day. Before, um, this man isn't you know, a friend of Caesar. But they were delivering Jesus to Pilate to be crucified. 
The word friendly is thrown out in the Gospels a fair bit. But Jesus now uses it, not in terms of worldly um, friendship or fellowship. He says now, if you, you know, the greatest thing you can do is to offer yourself for someone, for your friend, someone you like, someone you know, anyone, right? Your brother in Christ, in a sense, a good Samaritan is another example. But Jesus says to them, not just that, Caesar had these servants. That's all they were. They were of his household. They were his servants. But Jesus says, you are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants. See, the Jews, yes, they had God as Father in the Old Testament. But they had the idea more of God as Master. That's very well known. That's why they hated Jesus for saying, what are you talking about? God's your Father. Even though the language is there in the Old Testament, that's how they refer to themselves. Very explicit example is the Muslims. They'll believe it blasphemous to go God's Father because they can't understand how God can love them or how they can be children of God. Um, because God is just too great. But it's through Christ that, no, we're his friends. We're not just servants anymore. We're now his friends. We're not, just, we're not part of Caesar's household. We're part of God's household. We're God's friends. Not just like Pilate and um, Herod, their friendship. Jesus is saying, no, no, you're not just my servants. No, we are his servants. He's calling us to a greater intimacy. What, I don't know what, if I've delivered that well, but it's very beautiful. What the Muslims don't understand is that love provides, a, or humility provides a doorway for love. You know, yeah. that God loves, loves, so, loves the world that he, you know, basically made himself in the form of Adam. You know, and that, that's what they can't get their head around, that God would debase the humility. himself. They do not understand the humbling of God because their God is, or well, their, you know, on the top, top, very skin, like one millicentimeter is the same God we worship, but underneath it, it's yeah, absolutely it's so, not. So different. You know, underneath, like that one little mere school of a centimeter, it's not. That, that it's completely good. different. You know, completely Apart different. From the Trinitarian so, aspect that they you know, It's not just the Trinity. It's, I mean, Muhammad, believed, he allowed his followers to do a lot of things. And, you know, I don't want to like, talk this about Islam, but they have a lot of very funny rules and very things that they're allowed to do. I'll give you one example. In Islam, in the Hadith, just one example, because there's too many. When, people, when you wipe your bottom, your, butt, your buttocks in the toilet, you have to wipe it with rocks and an odd number of rocks. You can't wipe it with an even number of rocks. And you have to use rocks, by the way. Rocks. Because if it's an even number, it's haram. But only odd numbers are haram. You have to use rocks because that's what the Prophet commanded. So if you want to wipe your butt, it has to do with rocks. And there has to be an odd number of rocks. That's one of the actual beliefs that they believe. So that's one of the things. Yeah, but they have to use rocks. It has to be an odd number. It has to be an odd number. Can't be even because it's Adam. That's one of their many, many amazing, beautiful beliefs. Look it up. Well, I mean, you know what? To be fair, they would have been laughing when the whole world went crazy over it's on the paper. Um, but we'll go back to the topic and we can talk more about the beauty of Islam later, if, if so pleased. Because it is, a, as a good friend says, the noble, you know. <laughs> verse 15 I'm oh, sorry verse 14 I would like to draw emphasis Jesus says yeah look you want to be my friend you want to be part of my household you want to be adopted children excellent you know he's willing to offer it but he says you are my friends if you do what I command you and that's I suppose every week it hinges on the same thing every week it hinges will we say yes or not really it's as simple as that it's, it's actually that simple will we say yes to God or not? The choice is for us. <coughs> the book of Deuteronomy, I referenced that last year, not last year, sorry, last couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. when they fled Egypt uh, in, uh, from, when they fled from Egypt into the desert, into the wilderness, to go to the promised land, God told them, I've said before you two paths, oh man, you know, the path of blessings and the path of curfing. Therefore choose blessing that you have life. AKA he said, follow the commandments and he gave the, the commandments. I read the extended passage before, but it's a very long passage because he lists the good things and the commandments. But that's, in a sense, our option for all of us. Do good, and in your heart, do good, not just do exterior good. Anyone can do exterior good. Or do you want to do it in truth? Or do you want to not do it? And the choice is for everyone. Everyone has the choice. That's the beauty of God. He gives us freedom to choose. And then you would say, as I would say, you know, it's so hard, Lord, how am I going to do it? Jesus knows that. That's why he says, ask, ask and you receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open. That's why Jesus says, 
just said like a couple of verses ago. Whatever, if my words abide in you, whatever you ask, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Yeah. We're called to ask the Lord for help, and in fact, Saint Alphonsus would say we actually need to, as a matter of our salvation. So it can be done, and a lot of people have done it, and by the mercy of God, you know, we will attain to heaven as well, all of us. But for us to take away is, are we going to do it or not? And on top of that, again, to you know, to be realistic. Like to give the whole answer because a lot of people sometimes you can, for time sake, people can't expand that further. God knows we can't do it. God knows we can't choose good by ourselves. He knows it. So I sent the Holy Spirit. So I had to come down to earth to be crucified to suffer to give us the grace and merit for us the, the gift of the Holy Spirit to come to us. The Holy Spirit is the promise of God. The Old Testament talks about the Messiah. He is yes, but also of the Spirit that comes to soften our hearts, to soften our stiff necks. Uh, and to lead us and guide us. That's the Holy Spirit's purpose. A lot of the Old Testament, maybe we should do a week on the Holy Spirit. Uh, talks about the Holy Spirit um, and what it's going to do for us and how your young men shall dream dreams, your old men shall have visions. Uh, the book of Joel, Peter quotes in the Acts. Uh, but we'll hopefully talk about that. But the Holy Spirit does so many different things and principally, it's to help us say yes. Principally, it's to remind us, to guide us, to embrace, to encourage us so that we say yes to God's will as opposed to saying no. So, again, we have to say yes. We can't do it. The Holy Spirit's there to help us, to give us the grace, to motivate us, to move us, to remind us to do it. So, remember that, yeah, we want to say yes, but we actually can't without God's help. But if we ask and we're faithful, then God does give. So, so if we fail a commandment, we don't really love God. St. John Paul II, in his book, Viritari Splendor, which I was thinking about, that young man, he dedicates a whole encyclical uh, to that sort of passage and breaking it down. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He asked that question. And I believe in that he says, when we do a mortal sin, we don't love God. Otherwise, how could we do a mortal sin? Even if we think we love Him, we don't. Because by our actions. I can tell you I love you. And then, you know, someone says they love you and then they bash you. Do you really love me? You just bash me. But there's something going on that's wrong. and It's by your actions. So it's by our actions that we tell God, do we love Him or not? Yeah. In the spiritual life, there are many little things that can be spoken of further and many more um, that can help with understanding in a particular situation in the spiritual life. That's why spiritual director is always very good and I recommend everyone, if you're serious about your faith, to get a spiritual director because as the prophet said, as the Lord said to Isaiah the prophet, my ways are not your ways, uh, no man and your ways are not my ways. So... That's, that's unfortunately the situation we're in. So that's why Spiritual Director is awesome. To guide you where you don't see, where you can't see. And they help you um, to be the friend of Jesus, to be the friend of Christ, to say yes. Um, and they'll explain the scriptures more and how to live it practically. And then Jesus says, as I've already spoken, no longer do I call you servants. Uh, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, verse 16, but I chose you. Very, very interesting verse for a lot of reasons. Predestination, double predestination. What does it mean to be predestination? Oh, no. He must have been his wife. Yeah. 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 What does it mean? <laughs> his teeth, yeah. his teeth are coming out. You can see them coming out a little bit actually. Poor baby, poor little baby. Um, but yes, predestination. What is predestination? Do we believe in predestination? First, what is what is and what isn't predestination? Or double predestination? I'll talk about that first because that's a heresy. Um, John Calvin. Was it Calvin or Swingley? Which one? Calvin. Calvin. John Calvin believed in his thing that he, in his words, if God rode you like a donkey, you'd go to heaven, and if he didn't ride you, you'd go to hell. What does that mean? That means if God comes and rides you, comes with you, guides you, you go to heaven. If he doesn't, you're going to hell. Now, on the surface, it sounds preposterous, as it is preposterous. He's saying you pretty much don't have free will. That's what he's saying. He denies free will. Predestination means to pre... to prior know where your destination is, aka heaven or hell. The That's what it means. Pre, before, destination is heaven or hell. Yeah. So he would say double predestination is... No matter what happens, 
this person is either going to heaven or hell, and not only does God know it, but God is making it happen. So they deny, he denies free will, John Calvin. Mm-hmm. Um, which church did he found? Did he, he has Calvinists. his own. Calvinists. The Calvinists, yes. The Calvinist Protestant Church. They, it's from John Calvin. That, um, God created some people to be saved. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying right now. That's exactly what I'm expecting. That's exactly what I'm talking about now. It's called double predestination. Yes. Yeah. Yes, he made them just to go to hell. And they quote so many scriptures. I've seen their scriptures. You, you can be confused because the the, the uh, thing they make for it is very strong, but it is ridiculous and it's wrong because you know how can God do that, right? And He wouldn't do that. Create them for that purpose. In the book of life. Oh, that's what they'll say. <laughs> that's what they'll say. Yeah. The book of life is a real thing, by the way. It's not a joke, but they just twist it. It's in the book of Revelation. There is a book of life, believe it or not. There is a book of life where every one of the saints' names are written. <laughs> Hopefully, we hope so. No, no, it's just in the book of Revelation it says there'll be a book of life and the book will be open and everyone whose name is written in the book will go to heaven. Yeah. Um, but that's because we chose to get there. And I'll try, to, I'll try to explain it so we don't get confused. So double predestination, no matter what you do, if God rides you like a donkey in his words, you're going to heaven. If he doesn't ride you like a donkey, you're going to hell. Um, what does it mean by ride you like a donkey? I don't know how to use that. <laughs> that's, that's just the words he used. It just that's, sounds really weird. That's the word he used. <laughs> but, you know, what, he, what, he, what he's trying to say is... <laughs> And that's what he's trying to say. No matter what you do, you're either going to heaven or hell. God's destined it. Nothing you can do. Sucked in if you're going to heaven or hell. Good on you if you're going to heaven. That's it. That's John Calvin. That's Calvinism. Pretty much. Now, what is predestination? What is valid predestination? Because Saint Augustine actually spoke about predestination. And I've been actually praying a lot about it. God um, wants everyone to go to heaven. Jesus' passion is for every single person, every single human being. So God loves us with a predilection, predilector, there's the word, predilection, love. He loves everyone like that. He wants everyone to go to heaven. He gives everyone the choice, as the church fathers tell us. Like at least once in their life, everyone's going to have a chance to either accept God or reject God. Every human being has ever lived and walked the planet. Otherwise, if you never had a chance, how is that fair, right? God is just, God is fair. Whether they accept it or not, that's between them and God. I mean, if you think about it, people in the Catholic Church who have all the rituals of the sacraments, who have every grace and all the Bible studies in the world and all the internet to look up their beautiful questions, and they still reject God. I mean, I don't know how it is for the pagans or the Gentiles or whatever you want to call them, but they will have a choice too, like we all have a choice. So God loves everyone enough to give them an option, to give them a choice to follow Him. That's what genuine predestination is. That's all it is. That's genuine predestination. Everyone has a choice. And though God does know who's going to choose and not choose, He doesn't say, Michael, I don't like you. I'm not going to let you choose. You, I like you. I'm not going to let you choose. Everyone chooses. Everyone chooses if they're going to go to heaven or hell. By their actions, by their words. If you profess their lips and believe in your heart, Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. Another Protestants love that scripture. It's a good scripture, actually. Like, we interpret it well. That's what predilection love. That's what predestination is. God has predestined, in a sense, everyone for heaven, because He has chosen. He wants everyone to be in heaven. But we drop out. We tap out. We say, "Can't do it," by our actions, by our words, by whatever and however we do. Mm. Does, that, does that also cover the fact that God has predestined things for us that we don't choose, like our gender? When we were born, who our parents were, where, where we were born, where we live our life. I don't know if you would call it predestination, like the theological predestination term, but yeah, that is like not that exact term, but that's what it means. Yeah, God has chosen God Benji has to have, you know, to be, God, you know, however God toy has, he is. And... God has predetermined the nuts and bolts of our life for us yeah. then to, by our choices, work out either our salvation or With fear and trembling, 100%. Yeah, that's God made that choice. For us and for everyone. Um, and then there's a, there's a, another thing that in that, God gives everyone his sort of mission for them. To St. Alphonsus of Goro, to be a bishop, to be a great priest, a doctor of the church. That was God's will for him. 
Two, Father Benson to be a priest, accept his vocation to be a great man of the Lord. That's his vocation. You know, to Lou and Auntie Layla to be married. That's their vocation. Everyone's vocation, everyone's calling, everyone's accepting God's will will lead them to sanctity. That's what God's will is. God's will is literally the path to heaven. This whole day, I feel like I'm talking about the same three things, I suppose. Obeying the commandments, then how do you do that? You do God's will. You follow God, you say yes. Now, how do you do that? So we're going back another step. God has given you some sort of inclination or He's revealed His will to you. You follow it. It's as simple as that. That's how you do it. You follow the will of God as best as you know it through the guidance of the spiritual director, by the grace of God through prayer, meditation, through silence, through living the spiritual life, holistic spiritual life. That's how you go to heaven. That's how you get married, become a priest, whatever it is. Then in that, you grow in holiness. Then in that, you say yes to God more. You and it's easy. Married, become a priest. Yeah, or whatever it is. That's like the vocation, the calling, sacraments, that's holy orders. That's the vocation for the Easterns. Or, or both, <laughs> or if you're lucky, if you're an Eastern Catholic. <laughs> but whatever it is, you do God's will. You continue to do it every day faithfully. Then the little things and the big things. Uh, then in the... Actually, guys, have some muffins. If you're baked, if you're not actually made you some muffins. Oh, so. by the way, yeah. your container is on the... Oh, thanks. If I wanted that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, I don't know. But please, can someone open them up and give me one? Because I want to try them and pass them around. Um, they open up weird. It's like side opening. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's true. So I'll have a small one. Guys, please. There's little ones if you want a little one. They look like this. And then there's the bigger muffins in the inside. So I'll pass them around. Come on, man. Get into it. Which big one? They're cinnamon and blueberry. They're very nice. Yeah, I'm sure. Don't worry. I'm... No, they taste heavy. Well, the cinnamon's nice. It's good, huh? It's nice. It tastes alright. So, blueberry muffins. Hope you enjoy them, though. And God, God is good, Freddie, to do more penance than us. Yeah, right. Oh, sorry, Freddie. That's right. They've got egg and, and stuff. For Parramatta never to win a premiership. <laughs> for Bulldogs to never win at Belmore. <laughs> hey, listen, Parramatta won today. Mm. Mm. For Harry Kane to never leave Spurs. <laughs> um, I was having a really good point. What was that? You've got to win the grand final, bro. Yes, guys, I hope you really enjoy the muffins. They hope they're nice. They're a little labour of love. Um, actually, Auntie Layla inspired me. Inspired me to do this because she always everywhere we go, she always brings food. God bless you, Auntie Layla. Yeah, the Lebanese. Yeah, thank God, it's good. We're very lucky. We're very blessed like that, to be honest. Are these a good one? Go for it. Go for it. Give it a wiggle, or whatever you got to do. This one's. This one. I'll get it. Where are we? What verse are we using? Yeah. Gotta get one in, Michael. But I hope you guys enjoy them. But yes. So, I wanted to talk more about that. Because Jesus didn't say, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Now, there's more to it than just that sense of predestination where God desires everyone to go to heaven. Jesus' passion is for everyone, He has a love for everybody. Then I spoke about how Jesus gives certain people certain vocations, as evident by this passage. I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide. Now, Jesus gives to everyone a certain calling. He chooses us and he appoints us to do that calling. The question is, the million dollar question, are we going to fulfill the will of God? Or are we going to fulfill our own will? And as you figured from my tone, my voice, are you going to go to heaven by doing God's will or are you going to go to hell by doing your own will? Really the most basic, simple summary of the spiritual life is to do God's will. That's pretty much the basic, the crux summary. Do God's will in faith, hope and charity. What do you say, Father? Pretty decent, shortest creed ever, right? Pretty much, right? Faith, hope and charity. Faith, you can't please God if you don't believe in Him. Hope, God calls us to hope, aka to trust. So hope in God, to trust in God and charity animates everything. Love, love is what gives everything its vitality. life, its vitality. Exactly, good words, Father. Yeah, that's what love does. It gives everything its beauty, its gift. Its Love is so big, you can talk about it forever. But those three things summarize the spiritual life. And it's fulfilled in the sense of doing the will of God for you. Amen. Okay. And our last little bit. We've got last of the John. such a short chapter, Father. We'll get it. Don't worry. John chapter 18 to 27. The world's hatred. 
discussion. Oh, what time is it? It's 20 minutes. Oh, okay. We're like 15 minutes, like 10 to 10 minutes. Oh, well, okay, that went fast. All right, yeah, please, let's have a bite. You're a great boy. Guys, go for it, Sahtan. Any uh, any questions, yeah. points, points? Father, where's you? Father, do you still have your cake that you're not going to eat? Yeah, that cake? Yeah. Chocolate cake from yesterday? Uh, or do you finish? Oh, we'll talk. Okay, good, good. So, so, so Sorry? Robert's got a question. Sorry, What's your question, Robert? you got to say it now. Oh, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> so, you got to, so you made this. Actually, I've got to give credit to my wife. She made, she done a lot of it, and I've done a little bit. Yeah, that's well, they love that. They're, they're, they're finished. They're, they're finished, man. Did you press the button on the stove? No, no, I didn't. Did press... <laughs> 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 that's just me. Uh, other than oh, watchful oh, eye. You press the button on the stove. <laughs> <laughs> you put the button on the bed. On the bed. <laughs> 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 I'll hold on. They're really nice, huh? <laughs> Enjoy. Drama queen, huh? So John Calvin, I I I understand that analogy because. Was he's a heretic. heretic. Yeah, he's not a Catholic. This guy, this guy's schism. Calvin was a priest, wasn't he? I don't know. I know Martin Luther was definitely a priest, but Calvin was some intellectual, very well-known, respected person who opposed Martin Luther, started his own church. Because Martin Luther started the Lutheran Protestant Church. The first Protestant church was the Lutheran Protestant Church after Martin Luther. Um, then Calvin and Zwingli and a few of his mates came and realized, look, Luther, you're not doing everything right. We're going to start our own church. That's how Protestant began, right? Schism. Everyone do what they want to do. That's the beginning of Protestantism. I don't like you. I think you're 95% right. I'm going to go make my own church. And they keep saying that. And that's why every second street, you have a different church that doesn't recognize another church. Like, so that was his expression, is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Right, okay. That's called double predestination. We believe in predestination, not double predestination. Once, once, you, go, once you step into heresy, you step into the world of the bizarre. Yes. Because you've got yes. people trying to justify what is ultimately unjustifiable. So to say that God created people to be damned is just... It's ridiculous. Illogical. Yeah, it's ridiculous. There's no point to do it. You know what? Robert's got a question. What is heresy? Get away. What is heresy? Because I actually never like research. Yeah. Well, I'll wait for Father and then we'll answer it. Get away. Guys, we've got, a, we've got a question. Very good question. What is heresy? There's different types of heresy. I think there's material heresy. What's the other one? It's formal heresy. Formal. There's material heresy. Like, to break it down theologically, there's material heresy and formal heresy. Material heresy is someone who doesn't really know they're a heretic, but they're a heretic. And formal heresy is someone who should so know the, better. The word heresy means an error. error. An error, pretty much. Yeah. Error. 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 So if someone's... Martin Luther would have been a formal heretic because he was a Catholic priest. If anyone should know it's a Catholic priest who studied seminary, done, whatever. So he's a formal heretic. Someone would have tried to correct him, as they did, and he rejected correction. So you've now gone from... You can't plead ignorance anymore. Someone's come to try and tell you, brother, you're not doing the right thing, and it's trying to explain it to you. Yeah. If you still reject it, that's when you're a formal heretic. Yeah. That's the very bad one where you're like probably going to help. That's like someone's yeah, explained yeah. to you why you're wrong and to approach you, and you still deny it. Yeah, yeah. That's a formal heretic. So, uh, so most people are not formal heretics; they're material so you're heretics. Saying us Catholics would consider um, Protestants and Muslims are like. A materialistic heresy. Material heresy. Some of them are material heresies. Oh, Depends. A for, uh, in, it's a state. It's not like they are. They're just heretics, but it's a different state so of heresy. Formal, formal, is designed. Formal is like you're actually a heretic. Like it's not you like you complete it. ignorance. You're, you're a heretic. Might, you might have put it this you know? way. If someone understands the faith and then they reject it, mm -hmm. that's a formal that's, heresy. That's a heresy. But say mm -hmm. they, they reckon that about really at least thirty percent of Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Christ in yeah, the Eucharist. That's right. So they'd be they'd be, be heretics. That might be what's called a material Yeah, heritage. good summary, Father. They, they don't really understand their faith. That's why they But they still deny it. That, that a formal heretic so and who's culpable, a formal heretic is culpable. Because they understand what the church teaches, they've been given the benefit of that knowledge, and then they've rejected it out of pride. 
So either way is heresy. Well, it's heresy, but one, one, way worse. one, one person is told to beat the other, the other group perhaps aren't because they've never really understood yeah. what the church teaches. So they just, yeah, they just don't believe because it doesn't make sense. No. One's yeah. more evil than the other, but both are bad. So heresy in a sense, error. It's Good like, question, Robert. Good question. It's like, it, her, the word heresy, I was just looking at another question. It comes yeah. from, the word heresy comes from a Greek word, which which meant believing in a particular set of philosophical opinions. So it's, it's in the realm of opinion, but in relation to religion. So it's like believing in a different doctrine. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what it like, is. Like That's you, exactly you might, what it is. And, and yeah. quite often, Unless it's quite, doctrine. quite often yep. heresies came about mm-hmm. because of people struggle with the moral yeah. lines. So say you struggle mind. with purity or with, I don't know, remaining faithful to your wife or something, <clears throat> you might you might invent a religious system that allows your... King Henry VIII. King, King, yeah, King, yeah, King, King Edward II. He, he actually, he is. actually is, in yeah. a sense, he was, was a heresy. He most evil king. He, in a sense, was he actually believed in Catholicism, but he allowed he allowed the break with Rome because it suited his lifestyle. He was a very immoral man, very See, driven by life. lust, and, and had all those wives plus mistresses, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Martin Luther had terrible scruples about the sacrament of confession and justification, how somebody is justified, and so his whole thing was justification by faith alone, alone. Not by good works. So that was his particular struggle. So it's either an intellectual struggle with faith, but really that's a misunderstanding of faith, or it might be a moral struggle as well. So we might... so we all struggle with a sort of heresy in a way. Well well we struggle to live the truth. But but for some people they go a step further and they deny the truth yeah, because there's it a suits difference. them. There's a difference. It, it's pridefulness actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, and you see what Joey said in America. You go to America. America. Ivan's just been there. Some of you know Ivan. Yep. There's a different church on every street corner. There's the First Baptist Church, the Second Baptist Church, the Third Baptist Church, mm-hmm. and they just there's a new church founded each week. Mm-hmm. And they all claim to be the truth. They right? all claim to teach the truth, particularly about the scriptures, although they may not understand where the scriptures even come from right. or whether they've got a complete Bible. Exactly. Um, so once you step into the realm of heresy, I'm not saying that they're bad people, but those who understand certainly are culpable. And they would be. I mean, like I said last week, or I think I was telling my wife, like it's not good enough to be a good person to go to heaven. Jesus never says, and this I command you, just be a good person you go to heaven. Never once said that. Every, every week... Perfect. That's that's the goal, right? To be perfect, yeah. Heavenly Father is yeah. perfect. So many people say, oh, I'm good, per- I don't need to go to church, I'm a good person. Mm. So many people say that. One, right. one, what is goodness? Exactly. Big goodness question. Is? That's right. Mm-hmm. And, and as I say, it's, it's just not, it's a cop out, really. Yeah. It, it's, they're trying to justify what they what they really can't justify deep down. Yeah. Yeah. There's a saying, it's good to be good, but it's not good to be too good. Oh, it's got, you've got to be too good. Yeah, well, that's right. It's like a corrupt world saying, "Do the right thing, but don't do too much of the right thing." Yeah, that's the, in the workforce. But with God, you got to do too much of the right thing. Re- with with prudence, yeah, you got to do the right thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, hey, that's big magic. Yes, Margaret. Sorry. Can I add one more thing to that? If somebody, if somebody truly believes that they are good, say, they'd be running to church because you can never be too good. You 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 feel the joy. You want to go to church. Mm. That's the difference. When you want, when you want to find Jesus, you actually can't wait to get to church. Mm. Clever enough. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Beautiful. Benji. And if I can add that, when you when you're really uh, wanting to seek the Lord, you want to sh- keep striving in holiness and growing in the spiritual life. Because you recognise that the joy ultimately is going to be filled in heaven. Mm. Right now on earth, yeah, you can be happy, but for how long? Suffering is always there. But it's through that that we're glorified. It's through that. It's through Good Friday, the suffering of the cross, the shame, Jesus being naked, hung naked three hours in front of his family and all the religious leaders. Mm-hmm. And it's through that that he was glorified in heaven, the reign of God the Father for eternity. People need to know there's no good, uh, Easter Sunday without Good Friday. Exactly, that's right. Yeah. Just think of it this way when you're struggling or you're having a real bad day, right, and you're really struggling mentally, right? Who do you turn to? You turn to your friends or you turn to God? Right? If you turn to God, perfect. <coughs> He's going to help you through your daily struggles. Your mates are going to give you advice, but they're not going to be God. 
Beautiful. Another thing, if you, you <coughs> look at church through, look at church through, um, do you not like being with your loved ones? Do you not get joy when you're with your loved ones? Because I get joy being with him. Yeah. <laughs> We get joy being together, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. When you're with God, when we're with God, we get more joy. Yeah, like, sure. and that's when you, that's how we want to be with Him. It's not because we're obliged to be with Him. If you can, if you can, if I, I, I do, I, 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 I go past any church wherever there's a tabernacle, and yeah. I just. Sit there for 10 minutes and just talk to Actually, you guys just reminded me. Uh, Robert, I know you have a question. Do you still have a question? Yeah, I have one. Okay. <laughs> Say your question and someone remind me. Something happened in America. Something is happening in America with tabernacles. Very sad. Yeah, Something yeah. happened uh, today, actually. But yeah, Robert, you first. I was going to say, what, what is penance? Like, why do we have, oh, to, what is kneel, penance? Why do we have to kneel down to be close to God? You don't. Can... You don't have to do it every close oh, no, to God. I'm not saying we have to, but why do people kneel down to be close to God when we can yeah. sit down? Big question. Down? Very big question. I like that question. It's a good question. In the East, in the Maronite Church, I don't know if you know, but we don't kneel down during communion. Um, in the second Nicaea, sorry, in Nicaea, one of their canons or their rules, which is a canon or command they gave, was, um, which was a discipline at the time, a discipline given, which the Maronites still follow, is not to kneel or to prostrate yourself during liturgy on Sunday. Now, that doesn't mean that kneeling is evil. That doesn't mean that not kneeling is evil. Just that means at that time, in a sense, because when people kneel, slaves kneel. Historically, slaves are kneeling. Slaves are the ones on their feet, on the floor. That's historically what slaves do. We don't really have slaves anymore, thanks be to God. But to add, to give justice to your question, standing is a sign of power, sign of respect, sign of honor. Um, standing is a sign of dignity. If you can stand, that's dignified, as opposed to kneeling and lowering yourself. Now, just to continue that, that's, that's historically the answer. Um, why do Roman Catholics kneel in the liturgy? Why do now some people of the East even kneel in the liturgy? Actually, I don't know if any of them do. But why do they choose to adopt that? It's as a sign of humility, as a sign of their slavery to God. As a sign of them offering their self, submitting themselves to God. Why do they lay on the floor and they profess their vows, flat on their floor on their face, offer everything to God? It's the full humbling of themselves to God. To give everything. And, that's right, and that recognition is part of humility. And it's a good thing. Yeah. But it's also, it can be unhealthy if you think that God just wants you as dirt and you're trash. Mm. That's also unhealthy humility. Um, in the sense that you're very dignified. You're a baptized person. You belong to God. God paid for you with his own blood. You're his. You're not even your own. So that's why in the East they stand. That's why you're not allowed to prostrate on a Sunday. Because it's the greatest day of resurrection. It's a joy of celebration. It's a reminder of heaven. Where we'll be, you know, gowned with white garments. Standing before God. When we're on the floor, we'll be standing before God. In humility, perfect humility. Okay. That's why. It's a sign of that foretaste of the kingdom. Yeah. So to answer your question, no, you don't have to kneel. Yes, it's good to kneel because it helps you realize to humble yourself <laughs> before God, but you don't have to do it. And when you look at it too, when a priest, no, 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 for example, no, 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 no. a father who's ordination, they, they prostrate on the floor, they stand on the floor because That's they're, what dying, I they're dying from the earth. It's a symbolic, yeah. I, Lord, I offer no, you everything. No, no, no. But that's so, the symbolic. So then what is penance like? Just penance is a huge subject. <coughs> Jesus actually said, um, penance is like do penance for the kingdom of God is at hand. Depending which translation you use. Repent, do penance, <laughs> metanoia, change. Whatever, so that's what it is. Penance and repenting is the same. Thing. Make exactly. preparation for Exactly right. Like... Penance is not only that. That's not only what penance is. Penance is, let's actually, if I just watched a documentary on St. Francis of Assisi, I think yesterday, and it was talking about penance some reason. It was a good documentary on Formed. I recommend Formed if you don't have Formed on your phone. Amazing app. Uh, but penance, in a sense, is living in repentance. St. Paul says, I die to myself every day. What does that mean? I want to... For example. I want to eat everything on the table, but I want to die to myself and say, I want to offer up these two dishes and just have these other two dishes, as opposed to trying all four. That's dying to yourself, to your desire for gluttony, for food. So... It's a. That counts as a baby. So like what Gabby said. Um, if you decide to pray the rosary instead of listening to music. That's yeah, that's a that's a penance. That's a dying to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Even dying, even praying the rosary is dying to yourself because it's it's a mortification. It's, sometimes it's not easy. Yeah. It's hard sometimes going. it's boring. Sometimes, sometimes it's amazing. 
Well, no, one no, percent of people no, have black spirits, I believe. Yeah, the other ninety-nine percent spirits. Yeah, I, I, I can't understand. Yeah, that's it. The elevated, the elevated. Hey, of course. I mean, the reason why I'm tired right now is because I've been going out and having a lot of trauma in It's hard, of course. Yes. A hundred percent. And we should. And we should. Yeah. It makes it easier. It makes it easier. Definitely. But I'm your own. It's hard to get through. But it gives you some stain. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I thought you were going to crack a joke there, but no, you're all right. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, knowing Albert, oh, I know what you're talking about. You were talking to the joke now, Bob. No, no, don't worry. It was yourself. And every now and then you can get that oh, yeah. spike in motivation. Yeah. Uh, but Robert, your question is a huge question. I don't know exactly why you are. Why, do you want to explain what do you mean, what is penance? Or you just generally want to overview what penance is? Or do you have a specific... Because I've heard, I've heard some of the boys say, oh, when we pray, like when we pray the rosary or with divine mercy, oh, do you just want to kneel down as penance or something like that? I don't even know what that means. Okay, so your question was two in one. Okay, so I've explained kneeling to you. Do you understand what kneeling is? Why people kneel yeah. to humble themselves? So you don't you don't have to kneel to humble yourself. Yeah. In heaven, we're going to be in perfect humility, in perfect of all the virtues. Yeah. Um, not the greatest degree. Everyone have different degrees, but they'll have the completion in the sense they won't be lacking. Like they won't have vice in heaven. Yeah. They'll be perfect. Um, but they'll be humble and they'll be standing. You know. So humility isn't just about kneeling or lying flat on your face. You can stand and be humble. Number one. Number two. Penance is an offering. Penance is repentance. Penance is change. Metanoia, the Greek word for repent and believe in the gospel is metanoia. Sorry, I should have said that. The Greek word it means to so change. So you can that's, what I'm getting, that's what I'm getting to. Yeah, so that's you can pray for penance or the grace of penance. Yeah. Way. Yeah. yeah. Depending how you define penance, what you mean by penance, because now it's understood as penance is just a thing I do that I don't feel like doing. But that's not genuine, that's not genuine penance. That's not only what penance is. It's a part of it. But it's not what penance is. Penance is a life of everyday repenting. Penance is every day changing. Changing closer, taking yourself away and bringing God's self in you to live that divine life in your walk with Christ. That's what penance really is, you know? So if you ask the grace of penance, what would, what would grace you'll mean? You'll get suffering. You'll get suffering. That's what you'll get. Penance. Asking for penance means yeah. you're going to get suffering. That's what asking for penance is. But asking for the grace of penance would mean... But penance is also an act you can do voluntarily. So you might deny yourself something to um, make reparation for your sins yeah. or for the sins of somebody else. So you might think, I really like the muffins. Yeah. I'm not going to have a muffin. As he did today. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sanctifying grace, yeah. it has to do with the state of our soul. Yeah. If you're in a state of sanctifying grace, it means you have the love of God in your soul. Mm. And when you do when you do good things like prayer, penance, those kinds of things, it merits you um, eternal life. Yeah. You, if you aren't in a state of sanctifying grace, if you commit a mortal sin, then no, no matter what good you do, it, it won't merit you anything. Right? You have dead faith. So grace is about the state of our soul, but there are also what we call actual graces. So God might, we might in a particular situation say, Lord, help me with this particular thing, and God might send you a particular grace at that moment to help you in your life. But that's not, that's not like sanctifying oh, I grace. I remember now, yeah. Yeah, so sanctifying grace is, the state of, is about the state of your soul. You're either in a state of sanctifying grace yeah. or not. Exactly. If you commit a mortal sin, 
you, you lose you lose the grace of God. It means yeah. you, you aren't on the path to heaven anymore. Yeah. And even if you do do a good action, it won't merit you anything. Yeah. But once you're back in the state of grace, you can, by your good actions, merit heaven and yeah. a higher place in heaven, a greater degree of glory. But actual grace, the help, the helps that God sends us in our life, when we when we ask Him, we have to ask Him. You know, Lord, help me with this situation. I've got an exam. Help me to remember what I learnt, or um, you know, help me with help me to say this thing. To everything. This person. Ask for it's everything. Difficult. That's what today was about. You know, to yeah, reemphasize that. Prayer. You have to pray. Ask, we have to ask. You ask in my name. Our Lord says, you know, you have not asked anything in my name yet. Ask and you yes. shall receive. Yeah. Yeah. So sanctifying grace, actual grace. It's like it's like that. The help of God in our life, but it's also the state of our soul. Yeah. All right. Amen. Thanks be to God. We're going to skip Compline tonight because I'm just a bit under the weather, so I hope you don't mind. Maybe you can just go and pray a bit. We'll, we'll go to Greek, Greek Father. Oh, oh, we're going to get that. Greek food tonight, God willing. If everyone's keen, go out, nice Greek food. I've got a bit of cold. Euros. Vince is going to leave marijuana. Um, Father, concluding prayer when you're ready. Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our Father, Father, who I was in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. With your spirit. May the Lord bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Father. Thanks, Father. Beautiful. Thanks, everyone.